Today you've got your complete guide, the complete beginner's guide to the DJI Mini 4 Pro. But it's not just for beginners, it's for advanced users as well that want to understand all the features of the Mini 4 Pro and how they actually work. In this guide, I'm going to take you through the parts that you got in the box as well as which remote choices you've got uh, into getting it up in the air, all of the flying features and modes, the fundamentals of obstacle avoidance, uh, photo modes, advanced modes, active track, active track 360, sport modes, waypoints, hyperlapse, you name it. I'm going to cover it all in this video from start to finish. Now I've got quite a bit of experience flying drones more than a decade at this point, so I'm going to give you tons of little tips, both pro tips and just like simple practical tips that may not be super obvious if this is your first drone. Ah -ah. The lady just ran directly over the drone. Okay, with that, let's just get straight into it. When you buy the Mini 4 Pro, you've got basically one big choice to make. Which remote controller do you want? Uh, you have two basic options here. You've got what's called the DJI RC2 versus the other controller here is called the DJI RCN2, uh, and that one requires your phone be in it. Uh, it will charge your phone though if you want that, so you don't have to worry too much about battery life. Uh, but I personally find just having everything all in one here leaves me free to use my phone. Like if a phone call comes in or text message or something like that, I can still do that without having to sacrifice uh, the drone operation in the sky. From a functional standpoint, outside of the obvious screen in the RC2, they're pretty darn similar. Uh, the biggest difference is on the back of the RC2, there are two custom buttons that you can customize for a couple different operations. Uh, for example, changing the gimbal to point straight down instantly or things like that. Uh, and there's also one additional scroll wheel at the top here. Uh, again, not a huge deal for most people, but just something to be aware of. Now, the next question then becomes whether or not you want the Fly More Combo Kit. Uh, as a general rule of thumb, I find most combination kits from most companies are a waste of money. They're just upsells to get you to buy stuff. DJI is the rare exception, has been for a long time, in that category of actually being useful, in particular if you want the extra batteries. So the Fly More kit comes with uh, the RC2 here, the DJI RC2, and then in it it has this charging hub and two additional batteries. So you've got three batteries in total, plus of course the drone, as well as a bag and a bunch of extra props. Uh, so that is pretty handy and I prefer and I really like having extra batteries. Uh, I don't know if you would need three batteries, but I think you know having the extra battery at that point you you're not that much different in price, so you might as well just kind of go with it. The standard batteries for the DJI Mini 4 are expected about 30 minutes, but there's also a plus battery, a bigger battery, at 39 minutes. That larger battery is not available for sale in the EU. Uh, and the way you can tell the difference, by the way, between those two batteries uh, is that the ones that are the standard batteries have 249 grams listed on them, versus the ones that are the plus batteries uh, have nothing on them. That way, when the drone's looked at it, it knows whether or not it's actually 249 grams or not. The cool part, though, is if you do manage to get yourself a plus battery, they work just fine here in Europe. There's no problems with that. There's no locking system in place. Uh, it's just a matter that they do not sell these here. And to be clear, there's nothing legal about using the larger batteries here. It's just that in most cases that requires a different license category. Uh, so in my case, I have that. But if you didn't have that category, then you might be in a pickle if you were over the 250 gram weight limit, uh, which is, of course, the main selling point or one of the big selling points of this drone is that in many jurisdictions, you don't need additional licensing. Uh, that depends on which country you're in and all that kind of stuff. Uh, for me, the more practical aspect of it's just really, really really tiny. Like when I'm cycling, I can fit this in my back jersey pocket. Uh, the controller kind of fits in there too. The same goes for out trail running, that kind of stuff. Uh, it's really nice and lightweight and it still gets that longer battery life. Meanwhile, for the charging hub, that's like my favorite thing on earth. Uh, so it's got a USB-C connection on the side there. It's also got a regular USB for charging other things. So you can basically plug USB-C into this and then charge uh, the remote control, etc. You can also charge the drone on the back using the USB-C port that you'll see there. Uh, all these methods work pretty well for charging. I just find this really handy because I can just plug all these things in, it will charge them sequentially, so not concurrently, uh, until it finishes charging all of them. If you have any of the Mini 3 batteries, they're fully compatible with the uh, Mini 4, no problem there. Same true for the charging case itself, of course. Uh, but the controllers, they are not compatible, so they look almost identical, but uh, internally they're different and they're somehow not compatible between the 3 and the 4, so just kind of keep that in mind. Anyways, with that all set, let's talk about the drone and getting up in the air. So, it comes with this little um, basically clamp that keeps all the props from flying around if it's in your bag. Uh, I find this clamp really horrible, to be honest. Uh, DJI makes incredible drones, uh, incredible hardware, etc. When it comes to like things that strap the props on, they've always really struggled in there. I bought this like one for like two bucks on Amazon. I'll link it down below there. Uh, it just simply straps on. It just works way, way better than that. Uh, so you've got that on there to keep the flop props from flying around. Then you need to unfold it. So unfolding is pretty straightforward. You're gonna go to pull the front legs out like this, then the back leg, and then rinse, repeat the other side. Pull the front leg of the prop out of the way, front leg there, and then now you've got it opened up. 
Uh, then you've got the gimbal guard on the front. Uh, always, always, always use the gimbal guard when you're traveling with this and it's in your bag. Uh, the gimbal is the most sensitive part on this drone. Like I can take this drone, throw it right now over there, it'll be fine. Uh, but if the gimbal gets a head on smack, it might not be so fine. Uh, so we got this gimbal guard off right there. Uh, the thing about the gimbal is you can touch it. It's all cool as long as the drone is powered off. Think of the gimbal kind of like a flower. It's, it's fine when the wind's blowing out and all that, but uh, if you just go and like rip it, it's, it's not so good. So uh, you can touch it, no problem, but once that power's on, do not touch the gimbal on your drone. Now, the Mini 4's big claim to fame is obstacle avoidance, uh, in 360 degree obstacle avoidance in particular, uh, versus the Mini 3 had more limited obstacle avoidance. So there are two core sets of obstacle avoidance sensors here. Uh, there's the front set that you see right there, and they're on an angle on the side. What this means, they can basically see everything like this way, the side, the front, above it, etc. And the same is true for this one. And then there's two more in the back there doing the same thing, effectively creating this bubble around it. Then on the bottom, there's additional obstacle avoidance sensors as well as basically ground detection sensors. When it comes down to land, how close it is to the ground. Otherwise, you know, if it comes down like this, going really fast, it'll kerplunk the ground. You'll see as we do some landings, when it comes down close to the ground, it'll slow down and very, very slowly inch towards the ground and have a nice smooth landing. Okay, now let's get the drone turned on. To do that, you're gonna press this button here once and then press it again like that. And this will turn it on. Uh, you'll hear a little beep, beep, beep in a second. There we go, and now it's turned on, or turning on. I'm gonna go and place it down on the ground right there. I'll show you where I'm gonna place it. In the grand scheme of beginner's places, it's probably not the best place. Uh, but I don't have a lot of options, as you can see right here, it's mostly grass. Don't try to take off on grass, and never, ever, 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 ever take off on sand. Uh, you take off on sand, you might as well take off in the water. It's, it's just horrific for the drone. Uh, it'll attract it, it's, it'll be everywhere for the rest of that drone's life, and eventually it'll die. Uh, so take off something like this, just ensure the props aren't gonna hit anything when you go like that. Easy peasy. Then we'll turn on the remote control. For this tutorial, I'm gonna use the DJI RC2 uh, just because there's no particular good reason. In fact, I'll actually switch for the active track section to this one because I have a uh, remote control bracket on the bike here to show you that. So we'll do that later on. But to power this on, the same concept, you press this power button once short and then press it long like that. And you hear the chirp, 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 and it chirps on. Uh, do ensure that the antennas are up. You'll feel those like got a natural click position right around there. Uh, that's the point they're supposed to be in. Otherwise they're folded down like this fold in like that for travel. Now, if it's your very first time turning on the drone, do ensure you do the firmware update. The way it works for DJI drones and most consumer electronics is companies build this stuff months ahead of time, months ahead of launch, uh, they stockpile it, and then they, they ship it all out on the day of, of launch. I would do that all at home. Uh, general good practice uh, is basically just do that in the living room, turn on the drone, make sure everything's connected, uh, and then also make sure you can record to the SD card that's in there. I will link down below the SD card that I use. I use the same SD card on every action camera, every drone, uh, 256 six gig ultra. Also, you may wonder why there's an SD card slot at the bottom right there. Uh, that is for doing screen recording, for example, if you want to, or you can even copy basically a low res version of the footage onto that SD card. Uh, you don't need it to operate the uh, DJ RC. In the case of the phone based one, uh, basically it's just gonna write that information to your phone instead. Okay, with that all set, we're gonna tap that go fly button right there uh, and get into the screen to fly the drone. The very first thing you want to double check when you're doing this is that your max distances are what you want them from a safety standpoint. Tap that dot 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 in the upper right hand corner and then basically this brings up the safety screen. I'm going to scroll down here until you see the auto return altitude until you see flight protection, max altitude and max distance. Uh, so max distance I like to set usually, bring this down uh, to just a couple thousand meters, give or take. So basically if something goes really wrong with the drone, then I know it's gonna be within about 2000 meters of here. Uh, the max altitude, you can see I can adjust that. Anyways, with that all set, we're gonna go back here. Uh, we're gonna double check a couple things at the top. Uh, number one, we see our battery percentage, that's at 90%. Right next to that, we can see our recording time. We haven't started recording yet. Um, next to that, you see the RC at full signal strength. Next to that, that red stuff is the obstacle avoidance sensors. Because we're on the ground, it hasn't engaged those yet, so that's totally fine. Next to that, that 27 is the number of GPS satellites. Uh, always wait to have about 13 to 14. Uh, at that point, it'll change from orange to white. Uh, below that, you won't get an update of the home point. So it updates the home point so that if something happens where the drone gets lost, lose signal, etc., it'll always fly back to you. And I'll show you that in just a moment. And on the right hand side at the bottom, uh, we've got a bunch of photo video stuff that I'll talk through in just a second. Now to take off, it's pretty easy. You'll see on the left hand side that take off button. We're gonna tap that once. And then we just go ahead and long hold down the take off button and it'll take off the drone. You see it spins up and it'll take off to about a meter and a half or about four or five feet. 
Uh, so you can see it's hanging out right there. Hey, a quick note as I edit this, you're looking at the screen recording, which is a much lower resolution. Here and there, I will show you the full 4K video files and I'll label that in the corner, uh, but that's why things look a little bit low resolution and blonky because it's a live recorded session from the controller so you can learn as part of the tutorial. Make sense? Good. Now normally, as soon as I take off, I get the drone up and out of the air. So I'm gonna do that now by pressing the upper left-hand button to fly up like this. So we're gonna go up. So all I'm doing is just getting up out of the way, out of the way from people and things like that. And now let's briefly talk about the controls. You can practice them yourself out of like a nice big football field or something like that, but I'm just gonna kind of go through them really nice and easy. On the left-hand side here, if we go forward, it's gonna go ahead and go higher in the drone. So you can see that now increasing the elevation. And we go down like this, it's gonna decrease the elevation. There we go. Meanwhile, if I press to the left, you'll see it's gonna churn and rotate the drone on basically an axis. It's not moving anywhere else, it's just simply rotating like a top right now in circles. And the same is true of going this way, rotates right. Uh, the further I go, the faster it rotates. So I go all the way to the right, and I kinda of go halfway, and then it slows down, etc. On the right-hand side here, we've got how to go forward. So I press this to go forward. You see now it's going towards the trees. And then I pull it to go backwards. Just like this, now I see it's going backwards. And then likewise, I can go now press to the side over here, and it's gonna go laterally to the left. Uh, so it's just basically sliding, like a sliding across the dance floor to the left, and then the same here is true for sliding to the right. In the middle, we have the mode selector. By default, even if your mode selector is in the wrong place, it's always gonna start off in normal mode. So you can see right now my mode selector uh, is actually slid over to C, which is a cinema mode, yet on the screen you can see it clearly shows normal mode. So that's a good thing, it's to keep you from accidentally taking off in sport mode. Uh, so there's normal, cinema, and sport. Uh, cinema essentially just slows everything down. It basically like makes it so everything feels slower uh, when the controls are, are reacting to it, so you can get more cinematic moves. Normal is what you're normally flying in. Uh, and the sport mode allows you to a lot faster, but critically it turns off all obstacle avoidance sensors. So sport mode here is not like for sporty stuff, like you know, chasing a cyclist or whatever the case is, uh, though it can be, uh, it is for going faster the drone. It's basically a holdover from many, many years ago when DJI was trying to be more sporty with their drones, but uh, just keep that in mind. Now, if you tap the battery indicator right there, uh, it'll show you kind of three numbers. Uh, one is the first number until return to home, RTH. Uh, so RTH basically means that it's gonna return to its takeoff point and usually within uh, about a foot or two of that point, which is pretty handy. Uh, number two is until forced landing. Uh, so at that point, basically it's gonna start landing the drone slowly. You can mitigate that to a degree by holding the up sticks and moving it around, but it's eventually gonna get to the ground. It's gonna force its way there and then until the battery is fully empty. Uh, and so those are kind of the three things to keep in mind. By default, if I were to put this down right there, uh, it'll actually come back and land itself at the end of the day. So once it gets to that 16 minutes left or so, it'll automatically start a countdown, and then from there, it'll come back and land, uh, unless I cancel it out. So with that said, let me show you one more thing, which is what to do if something's going wrong. So let's say you're, you're moving around, you're flying like this, and you're like, oh no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go down into the, the canal there. All you do is let go, like literally just, just let go. Anytime you're not sure, just let go and everything stops. The drone stops exactly in place. It's as simple as that. Likewise, if you're just feeling like it's having a bad day and you wanna get it back to you as quick as possible, or at least as efficiently as possible, you just long press this button up here and that's gonna to return to home. And you'll see right now that green pipeline, a green path there, uh, that's showing you the basically an augmented reality version of how it gets back to its starting point. In this case, it's just going straight over here and straight down, uh, but you will see cases where it may have something in front of you, it's gonna go up first and go over that and so on. Uh, it's pretty cool. We can cancel that at any point by simply pressing the cancel button left-hand side. Uh, likewise, that same little pause button up there, that is if you're doing a move, like a quick shot or master shots, et cetera, like I'll show you later on, and you just need to stop really quick, you stop right where it is, right then and there, just press the stop button, uh, that pause button, and it just instantly stops the drone in the sky and pauses and lets you figure out what you need to do next. Now, at the bottom left-hand side of the screen, you're gonna see a couple things. See that little map icon? And to the right of that, you see where it shows the height, 19 meters. So if I go up, it'll increase. There we go. And you see above that, my vertical speed is uh, basically increasing or staying about the same now, 18 kilometers an hour. And if I go down, you'll see it decrease, et cetera. And then the right of that is my distance. If I go forward, you'll see it basically is increasing my distance and my speed is showing above that as well. Uh, if I tap this map here, I will see a map. In this case, I haven't downloaded anything, so it's pulling it off of uh, Wi-Fi on my phone, but you can download maps ahead of time. Uh, that way you can download the area you're going in case you don't have any cellular signal or connectivity there.
Now at this point I want to talk about obstacle avoidance. So I'm going to walk over here and we're going to fly into the trees. Now one thing I want to point out is that by default a DJI sets is to be brake versus bypass. If you go to the settings option under safety, you'll see the option to set it to bypass. Check that so it goes around the obstacle as opposed to stopping for the obstacle. So you can see the drone out there, which I hope you can see it anyways. You should be able to see it right out there. Uh, and you can see the trees over here. Let's get a little closer. And as we get closer, you'll see that there's a yellow showing up on the screen solely. Right now it's the downward obstacle avoidance. Uh, so that's because there's basically stuff within about three meters of it downwards. Actually four meters is the threshold, but it doesn't quite pick up the stuff out there in front of it. Uh, I'm gonna go down a little bit lower on purpose here. So you can see me going lower. And now I'm just gonna go straight forward towards the trees. And you can see it automatically rotated right around to the right of the trees. Uh, the same is true also if I try to go to the side. So watch, now I'm gonna go try right into the side and it's saying, nope, it's gonna go over the top of those trees automatically. Once it's clear of them, it's gonna keep on going. Pretty cool, right? Uh, the same is also true for going backwards. So I'm gonna go now backwards into the trees. Here we go, just going straight back and I should go right over the top of them. There we go, straight over the top uh, without any problems at all. And that is that 360 degree obstacle avoidance. The same is also true if I try to go up into something, okay? I'm gonna tell it to go straight up, which should hit these tree branches up here, but you'll see it moves backwards to get out of the way. Now this works great, especially when it's very green like this, uh, cause it's still, you know, early fall. Uh, but if you're in the winter, especially later in the afternoon, or if it's a dark overcast day, be aware that it will not pick up small branches. You can see this in my ActorTrack video. I'll link that in the corner there, uh, where basically those branches have already lost their leaves. Uh, and it'll plunk into those tiny little twig-like branches and potentially take your drone down. Okay, so let's talk about video now and video recording. On the right hand side, you basically have your options for choosing video modes. So tap that little film strip icon right there and you can see normal, night, and slow motion. You'll also see to the right of that, photo, video, master shots, quick shots, hyperlapse, and pano. Hyperlapse and pano. Uh, so master shots and quick shots uh, and even hyperlapse to a certain degree are all technically video modes, uh, but they've separated them out this way. So in the normal mode right there, we've got that selected. Now I'm gonna go down to the very bottom, you see res and FPS. I'm gonna tap that, and this is where I change that resolution. Do remember to do this, because by default it'll be a lower resolution, that's kind of like a sad panda moment. So, uh, you know, you bought this expensive drone, use the resolution. Uh, so in this case, 4K is what I'm selected, and you can choose the frame rate down the bottom right there. Uh, I'm gonna choose 60 frames per second, just so I've got that at the, the full frames per second right there. And then to the right of that, you see the ability to change my exposure compensation. Uh, so I can go ahead and do that by just tapping these options right there. And right now it's exposed quite well, so I don't need to do that. Uh, it's a nice sunny day. In fact, one could even argue go down a third of a stop, but I think we're, we're fine where we are. Uh, and then you've got that record button to the right of that. So if I tap that right there, that'll start recording. You hear the chirp, that means it's recording. There's also recording buttons and shutter buttons on the top of the controller. Uh, so you can see this right here, that recording button. I can simply tap that to record something. And I can also tap this to stop recording. So press that once, it stops recording. Uh, now, looking back at that film strip icon there, uh, if we go down to slow motion, you'll see these are slow-mo modes. Uh, so basically, slow motion modes means it's just gonna record more frames per second. So if you go down to the bottom now, you see the res and FPS. I can do 1080 um, at 200 frames per second, or I can do 4K at 100 frames per second. Now, keep in mind that generally speaking, uh, most shows, et cetera, most YouTube, all the fun stuff is generally played back at 30 frames per second. I know there's, you can debate that all you want, but just for simplicity's sake, 30 frames per second. Uh, so that means that in a case of 1080p uh, at 200 frames per second, I could slow this down 200 frames per second, divided by 30, eight and a half, nine times, give or take. That means it'll appear eight and a half to nine times slower uh, when I play it back at that normal speed. Uh, and in fact, you can see this right now. I think there's some boats or whatever got slow motion on the screen for you, just to kind of look at the way that looks when you slow things down. Uh, we're not shooting this I would not shoot in this mode all the time though, by the way, just shoot in this mode when you need to because there's other trade-offs to be made. For example, you can't do active track in this mode and, and things like that. So I would go back and just shoot in normal mode unless you're trying to shoot something that you want to look epic once it's slowed down. Next, we've got the gimbal. And the gimbal allows you to rotate the camera up and down to see things below you or above you, etc. cetera. Uh, and it also allows the camera to rotate entirely for vertical shooting mode that I'll talk about in just a second. To control the gimbal, you'll see the gimbal wheel on the top of the control here. Uh, I just simply rotate it and now we're going down. We're all the way down to 90 degrees. So we'll go down, all the way down, 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 down. And now we're pointing straight down. Uh, if I were to go back over the top of me, so I'm gonna scoot back right here. You should see this in three, two, one. There I am, right? Set up like that. Uh, and then I can go back forward by just pressing the other direction. Uh, what's cool though, if I go like this, is the C1 custom button there, uh, by default, will actually rotate the gimbal straight level or straight down. 
So I tap, tap it once, boom, straight back to level. So I don't just sit there and like slowly adjust that. You can change the speed of the gimbal and all the controls uh, in the settings and then choose the gain and expo tuning option. And you can tweak that as you see fit for all the different things there. Uh, I wouldn't do that unless those other modes don't, don't fit your, your, your fancy, if you will. Uh, I find it just fine kind of the way it is. What's notable is that the gimbal on the Mini 4 can go up to 60 degrees up. So watch this if I go all the way up like this. You may be asking yourself, why would I want to shoot the sky? Uh, and the answer is that sometimes you want to start up below something and rise up with it and basically change that orientation as you go. You can see the shot I did yesterday, uh, this windmill, I'm far away from it, so don't worry, but uh, basically where I started off low and then slowly rose up uh, and adjust that gimbal. So basically it was you know slowly going down as I went up, etc. cetera. Uh, something you might do for a skyscraper, uh, whatever the case may be. So that flexibility is there if you want it. Now in the lower right hand corner, you've got the ability to adjust more of the video settings. So if I tap this uh, auto button there, you'll see now it goes into pro mode and I can change different settings. So I can change, for example, uh, the white balance there. If I untap the auto, I can change white balance. I can scroll down, I can do color from normal to HLG uh, to D log M. Just to demonstrate the difference if I go from normal where it normally is uh, into D log, you can see it becomes much more dull and flat. Uh, this is if you're doing color grading. Uh, so D log M isn't quite full log format. It's, it's pretty good, but it's not full log format. Uh, if you understand what I'm talking about, then you probably know the nuances already. Uh, if you don't understand what I'm talking about, then don't shoot in D log M. This requires you to color grade after the fact, otherwise your footage won't look that good. Uh, and it's gonna take you many, many hours to color grade most footage for any sort of video. So uh, just shoot in normal mode or HLG mode if you want a bit of that, uh, that higher dynamic range look to it. If I tap the right hand side of that menu now, you can see I can change my ISO, so I can turn that on or off. Uh, I can also change my shutter uh, and then again adjust the exposure I saw at the bottom there. Just to tap again the Pro back to Auto, gets you right back to where you were, where you can simply adjust the exposure compensation if you need to adjust that. Next, I want to show you vertical video. No place better to do it than a brief field trip to the lighthouse. If you look to the left of the recording button on that full right hand side there, there's this little rectangle that rotates the entire gimbal. So the whole gimbal actually rotates. It's a unique feature of the uh, Mini 3 and Mini 4 Pro. And I can zoom in here a little more. And this basically gets my full resolution now in the vertical mode. So I can hit record. And now I'm seeing this basically the entire gimbal being rotated, the entire camera system being rotated, and this allows me to get vertical footage. This is better than cropping in because you get the entire sensor range as opposed to just a small portion of it. Uh, this is also available, by the way, in other modes. So you can see here, if I go to slow motion, for example, I can do vertical video there, uh, I can do it in photos, etc. Even ActiveTrack supports vertical video mode. Uh, it's unfortunately it's something that's not available on the higher end drones with the zoom cameras and whatnot, uh, but still, it is great to have that vertical video option when you want it. So for example, this shot here really primarily works best in vertical video because that dock going out or the pier going out behind it, the waves, etc. Uh, this shot, if I was to crop in, probably wouldn't look as good normally. Versus I'm shooting for a full uh, you know, landscape horizontal mode, then I'm gonna shoot like this because it has the entire width of that picture because you're not likely viewing it on a phone. Additionally, another area I wanna show you out here is zoom. Uh, right now I'm at 1x zoom. You see on the right hand side there, but if I tap this, it'll zoom in to 2x and then again to 3x. Uh, and basically this is zooming in digitally, so it's simply cropping the image. It's not uh, like the actual zoom that you'd see on the Air 3 or the Mavic 3 series. Uh, so again, just tapping that in once again. Uh, just simply manually zooming that in. And again, I would probably just do this afterwards. I wouldn't necessarily crop in here, uh, unless you're in a case where you know that this is the exact thing that you want and you can't get there for some reason, or it's not safe to get there, either people, etc. cetera. Uh, then in that case, sure, but otherwise I would go ahead and just kind of leave it as is and crop after the fact in post-production. You can also use zooms to do stuff like this. Watch as I tap from the 3X uh, out to the 1X. It's gonna zoom out in that image. So it's kind of cool. It gets the uh, windmill, not the windmill, the uh, lighthouse in there, and then I can tap in to zoom in again. Now I'm really far from the sailboat since I don't know the guy, so that way I'm not uh, interrupting his life. Zoom in again to the 3X and it does that nice smooth transition, which is cool. So we can just see that low battery turn to home. Uh, it gave me a 10 second warning. I'm going to cancel that for right now. Uh, you see that at 20%. I'm going to do quickly the photo mode, then we'll land it and I'll show you how this all works. Uh, so photo modes are virtually identical to the video modes. Uh, and again, we're getting into all the advanced modes in a second. This is just sort of the primer of how things work. Uh, so in the case of photo modes, I tap that film strip there. Then I tap, tap the uh, photo button. There we go, takes a second. And now I have single AEB, so auto exposure bracketing if you wanna manually do HDR photos afterwards, or automatically do them too. Uh, time shots and burst. Uh, so to take a photo, get rid of these uh, low battery prompts, there we go. To take a photo, you use the right hand top button, take a photo, simple as that. Um, or you can just press that button on the right hand side right there. 
Notice at the bottom, it shows the number of photos remaining, 7,034, and the format. Uh, in my case, I've selected JPEG plus RAW, but you can choose just JPEG or just RAW. Uh, my general preference is to shoot JPEG and RAW, so if I want to just quickly grab a photo, I've got the JPEG, but if I want to work on it and add more, more flavor to it later on in Lightroom or something like that, I can shoot with RAW. So I've got both of those there uh, at all times. The same custom options are there as well, so you can see uh, changing the exposure compensation, or I can go press that auto button down the right-hand side and change basically all the settings I could on the other side of things. Uh, now, at this point, it's upset about my battery situation. You see we're going through 15% uh, right now. It's gonna start beeping. Uh, and then eventually it's gonna land where it is. Uh, so one of the things to be aware of, that first time when it asks me for return to home, uh, it'll basically fly back to me. But right now, it's not quite over the river, it's over the bushes, etc. Uh, it would land right there when it starts to land at, I believe, 10% or so. So you can see if we tap that battery icon in about one minute and 10 seconds, it's going to start to land. But I'm going to go and go land it by itself. So I'm going to use the return to home option on the left-hand side. There we go. I'll tap this once. Come on. And then return to home. You just got to hold it down for a second. And now it's going to fly back to me automatically and return to the point it took off from. And I just want to show you how close it is uh, to that point. So put that there for a second. And you can see the way this is working is the drone's up above us. And we're going to see if it'll land in the exact same spot or not. And I'm ready to press warning. the cancel button if I need to. Because you can see it's not quite the exact spot. It's very, very close. Uh, but in my case, it would be off the path, uh, which isn't super ideal. But let's see. Oh, maybe it'll get back. It's like half a foot. Oh, is it going to find it? It's going to use this downwards camera sensors to find the exact spot. Will it do it by itself? Oh, no, I just got an aircraft under, uh, area under aircraft unsuitable for landing. So I've just got to land it by itself. No big deal. I'm going to go forward a little bit and press down. Landing. And you can see I'm pretty close. I've got a little bit of the props in the grass there. No big deal. Uh, again, the props are pretty durable, uh, but if they hit a rock or something, then they might need to be swapped out. So I'm going to swap out the battery super quick and easy. I'll show you how that's done. I'm going to go back here. Uh, do remember to stop recording if you were recording anything. And then we'll go back and we'll turn off the drone by pressing it once and then pressing long hold again. It turns it off. Uh, now to take a battery out, you're going to press these two buttons on the side and just pull the battery out of the back and put that down in here so I know which ones are which. And then we'll press these buttons right here, grab this, and we'll toss this one in. I'm going to toss actually the longer one though. This is the plus battery, so you can see it all fits in there. Easy peasy. And now I'll press it once and press it again, long hold to turn it on. And I'll go put it back in our takeoff spot. Take off. There we go. Up we go. And now I'm going to go and resume our little photo journey. Okay. So back in photo mode right here, we tap that photo icon again. Uh, and we can see there's the auto exposure bracket and time shots. Time shots are useful uh, when you want to go ahead and take something on a certain interval. So you can see interval down to two seconds. So every two seconds it takes a photo. This is actually really handy if you're trying to capture something uh, where you just want it to keep on going over and over again. Uh, so sometimes I use this if I'm trying to capture like cycling up a certain area. If regulations allow me to put the controller on the ground, it can be handy for that. Uh, so basically I just ride to the frame. Uh, normally I would just use video mode and take a screenshot or basically a still from that video. But sometimes you really want the flexibility of having a JPEG, or sorry, a raw image uh, after the fact. Again, tap the other side there, you got burst mode, uh, and you can see the options right there. Uh, same thing applies here. In almost every scenario, you're going to want to use either slow-mo or video uh, at 4K resolution to capture that exact moment better. Uh, seven frames in a second is, is pretty low, to be honest, for burst photography. Uh, but again, it gives you that flexibility resolution-wise if you need that. Now, if we go back on the right-hand side there, we can go into the panorama modes. Scroll down to pano. There we go. And these are the different modes you've got. So you've got sphere at the top, 180, wide angle, or vertical. Uh, so we're just going to shoot a 181 right there. And we can choose our format option of output being either uh, JPEG or RAW. I'm just going to keep JPEG for now and press the record button. You can see it's going to automatically start taking a bunch of photos and it'll stitch these together. Uh, so it's pretty straightforward. If you're doing a sphere, it'll be a lot more photos than it does before it stitches that together. And this is true of all the other photo modes or all the other panoramic photo modes as well. So you can see the 50% up to 100% is actually the stitching portion uh, versus that first 50% is the taking of the photo portion. So we can actually already start moving while it's finishing that. We're going to go over the windmill here. Okay, so let's look at quick shots. Uh, so we'll tap the right-hand side and go down until we see quick shots. Quick shots is one of the best ways to get uh, little snippets of video with kind of perfectly done shots. Uh, so you see those options there. I got droney, rocket, circle, 
Helix Boomerang and Asteroid. These haven't changed in, in recent uh, DJI memory. We're just going to choose the drone. You can see a little image of what each one does. So I'm going to go down a little bit closer here to the uh, windmill. There we go, just like this. Uh, and I can either draw a square around it, or a rectangle, so like this. There we go. Okay. And I can then choose the distance from the bottom there. Come on, pop up. And choose the distance of how far it's going to go. We'll say 50 meters and then press that start Three. button. And there's a second option for how to recognize objects as well that I'll show you in just One. a second. Now it's going to do this movement for you automatically. You can see on the right hand side there uh, the progress. And you can see how it's slowly zooming away from it. Uh, obviously, if I was closer to the windmill, there'd probably be more dramatic shot. But right now I'm just doing uh, kind of the simple shots right here. And it automatically returns as well, by the way, when it's done, you see it's returning to a start point. I can tap the X if I don't need it to do that. Now there's the other quick shot modes as well. They all have about 15 seconds or so of time for each one of them. Uh, however, what's really cool is master shots. Uh, master shots is probably one of the neatest features DJI has done in the last few years. And it's something that's just way overlooked, which is really too bad. Because what it does, it gives you three minutes of perfect B-roll. Uh, so essentially three minutes of B-roll for whatever you want. So in this case, I'm gonna say we want this windmill right there. And then I will highlight the windmill again, just like this. And we see estimated flight time. Uh, so I can change this to the bottom there. I can say, uh, I want the medium uh, width, the medium length, or the medium height. In other words, imagine a box around this. How far uh, is the drone going to go around that particular box, within that box around this object? Uh, and so we're gonna just leave that all as is, and then press start. Uh, and what's gonna happen now, is it's gonna go through a whole set of moves, basically movements, essentially a bunch of those quick shot movements, and stitch them together into one big long two minute, in this case, video. If I'd selected some of the other options there, you would see it increase the time to 220 or 240 or three minutes, et cetera, uh, depending on how much range I gave it to do stuff with. Uh, and you can see it iterating through each one of these. Right now it's doing a droney move first, and when it's done with that, it's gonna to go to the next move and on and on and on. And now what most people focus on with master shots is that the DJI app at the end of the day will create this cute little video with music and all this kind of stuff. And that's cool. Like that's great if you just wanna show the windmill and 15 seconds of windmill fame and I'll show that at the end of the video. Uh, but in particular, it's great if you're a professional that wants B-roll of the windmill and has two minutes to do it because there is no drone pilot on this planet that can be as perfect uh, with the shots as this is doing right now in this time efficiency. In other words, there's nobody out there that can get these nine or 12 or so shots in two minutes done exactly perfect every single time. Uh, and this is what this does. So it's great for that. You take this footage, you've got 4K beautiful footage as is, and you're good to go. And again, at the end of the video in the app section, I'll show you how the app takes all these shots together and makes this cute little movie from it. Uh, so next, let's talk about hyperlapse. Uh, so I'm gonna tap the X there because we don't need to kind of wait any longer on that. I'm gonna go point it towards this direction. There we go. Perfect. And I'm going to tap the uh, master shots icon and I'm going to scroll on down to hyperlapse. And now what hyperlapse is essentially a moving time lapse. It's going to take the drone and it's going to fly that away or whichever way I've set in the menu options here. So you see the options are free, circle, core sock, or waypoint. Uh, so circle would be great on a day like this where it's actually relatively windless uh, to do a hyperlapse around that windmill where I just go all the way around over the course of say 20 minutes and then watch the sky, whatever else is behind it is doing its thing. Uh, in my case, I'm just going to go straight across. So I'm going to use core lock instead, but you can also see waypoint, etc. Uh, and this is again over longer periods of time. So I'm going to use course lock. I'm going to lock the course by pressing that little lock option right there that locks my heading. Uh, and then now below that you see how many frames and kind of the different durations I want. Uh, so the interval, I can change the interval. So I can say every X number of seconds, we'll keep it two seconds though. Uh, the length is my final output length. Right now, it'll be five seconds long, uh, and it'll take me four minutes and 10 seconds to shoot that. And you can see my speed here, I can adjust that. I want it to be fast because fast is always more fun. There we go. That'll work just fine. 10 kilometers an hour. Uh, I'm gonna go up a little bit higher. Okay, just a little bit higher. And you know what I'm gonna do? I'm actually gonna turn around on second thought because there's trains there. So eventually we'll see some trains whiz by, uh, which will probably be cool in the shot. There we go. Now five seconds long and hit the record button and off we go. And now you basically just wait for that uh, four minutes and six seconds to do its thing. Uh, now, what you'll see there is an option there that allows me to expand that out. So if you know you're going along and go, you know what, I need an extra second of end state footage or I just something's about to happen, like I see a train coming, I go, oh, I wanna capture that train in the shot. You just press that little plus one second and it adds time to it. So you can do that anytime you want until the end of it, obviously, uh, to add extra time to that hyperlapse. 
The thing to keep in mind about hyperlapse is you want movement in the shot. Uh, if you're just flying across empty fields without any movement, it's really not going to be that exciting. Like, this shot probably won't be very awesome. Uh, versus if you've got other things happening, like a busy harbor, etc., that's what a hyperlapse is best for. Or if the clouds are moving, all that kind of goodness. Now, it just gave me a warning right there that's got 30 seconds remaining, so if I want to add that extra time, now's a good time to do it. Also, note at the bottom, there's two different export options. Uh, I've got both 4K and JPEG, meaning that it's going to output every single one of these still photos, but it's also going to give me a completed video file as well. Uh, so, I'm gonna cruise on there. I don't think I need to add any more time. We got to that particular train flying by. Uh, I could wait longer to get more trains, but I think you get the point on how this works. Perfect, video is done. Let's get back over to my windmill. Uh, and let me just see this right there. See that H? That is actually the augmented, uh, basically, reality AR of my home point. I didn't mention it earlier on, but that's showing where I am. So if I just, you know, go to the right like this or to the left, uh, you can see it's got that little dot of where it thinks I am. It's right now putting me a little more in the field. It's not quite perfect, but it's, uh, it's close enough to get me back. If, if I can't see my drone when it's that close, I've probably got, probably got more issues at that point. Uh, so we're going to get on back here, and we're going to go over here. We're going to shoot our waypoints. Okay, so what Waypoints allows you to do is to create a course that will be repeated over and over again. This is particularly useful if you want to show the progress of something, like a construction site. This allows you to go ahead and have it fly that same route repeatedly. So tap the right-hand button here, and we're first go into video mode. Uh, so we're just back in regular video mode first. Give it a second. There we go, normal mode. And the left-hand side, you see that little, like, squiggly snake-looking thing over there? There we go. We'll tap that, and that pulls up the Waypoint menu. Uh, and you can see Plan Waypoint Flight. I'm going to go up a little bit, uh, and I'm pointing down the river coming towards me, you can see me way out there where the H is, uh, and I press the C1 button to add a waypoint. So I'll press the C1 button once, uh, or you can just press the bottom right there as well if you have the regular remote control, and it's gonna add that waypoint. I'm gonna tap this option there, come on. There we go, uh, and now you can see that first waypoint being added, even a little picture of what it looks like. Uh, next what I'll do is I'm gonna move forward down the river a little ways, okay, like this, and I'm gonna add the next waypoint. Okay, press, you can press the little button down the bottom there or press the button and roll control at the back. And now I'm gonna go and change towards the windmill. Kind of keep it, I'm gonna keep away from this person over there. General rule of thumb, by the way, is keep away from people. Just be a good neighbor. Uh, people don't understand drones. And sometimes, you know, they'll be super interested in drones. Every time I've been out here filming, people walk by, they've always like, wow, what are you doing? Even like 70, 80 year old people, um, the same thing, but just uh, keep that in mind. Go ahead, you're good. You're good. So I'll add this next waypoint right here. There we go. And now I'm gonna go increase in altitude and kind of go this way. I'm gonna change my gimbal direction a little bit, just down like this. By the way, if you hear the airplanes, those are about 8,000 feet above me right now, so not a big deal. Yeah, it's like a tutorial of sorts of how to use the, the drone. So, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Have a good one. So like I said, everyone is super friendly out here. Just be friendly, just don't put a drone in someone's face. That's why I always get drones out away from people as soon as they come by. Uh, so now we're gonna add this next waypoint here. There we go. And we're gonna add one more out over here and I'm kind of rotating around. So these are, it's gonna remember everything about the shot. It's gonna remember the camera angle, it's gonna remember uh, position, the altitude, etc. One of the things to keep in mind, uh, as I put on sport mode, I'm gonna change it back to normal mode there so I don't get in trouble. One of the things to keep in mind about this though is that it's a little bit finicky when you get really close to things. So uh, if you think you're gonna like weave through the trees in this mode, it'll tell you to stop. So, so don't try that. Uh, with all that all said, I got my five waypoints. You can add a bunch more waypoints, but we'll just go with five. You can see the duration and the distance up there. But if we tap the dot, dot, dot to the right, uh, we can change the speed and watch as that duration decreases. So 45 seconds, that's what I want. At the end of that, I want to return to home. Uh, sure, signal loss, return to home. Again, these different options, I can change what to do. If something happens. Uh, and then start at waypoint one, there we go. And then we'll press go. Uh, and I'm going to start my recording now uh, because just I don't want to forget later on. Uh, and then we'll go basically back to the starting point and then you'll see that countdown timer there and as it ticks through the different waypoints. What's cool about this is that it saves this flight after flight. Okay, it's getting ready to start here. So there we go, we can see it's now started that, that and it's gonna iterate through this. Now it's moving pretty quick as you can see, right? It's doing its thing, uh, flying and now slowly rotating. You'll see it go to waypoint two in just a second here. And it's gonna kind of smooth out those edges a bit. So now it's into waypoint two and so on. So what's cool is this is something you can save by the way. So you can do this you know, time after time again, uh, the same exact set, uh, same exact route. Uh, now it's flying this. So again, depending on what you wanna use it for, uh, I'm gonna show you the next feature, which is the ability to do spotlight, which gets into active track mode and so on. So we go over to our favorite little windmill right here. Here we go. We're gonna go out of the waypoint mode. I'm gonna turn that off. 
There we go. I'm going to save it. There we go. Save and exit for next time. And then we've got the film strip back in our normal mode. Okay. Uh, I'm going to record this so I don't forget later on. And then what we can do now is we can highlight the windmill just like this. We're just in regular mode. We're not in master shots or quick shots. We've highlighted a windmill. And at the bottom, we see three options, actor track, spotlight, and POI. So starting off with POI first, what this allows us to do is to go ahead and move around this particular waypoint at different speeds. So it's basically just going to rotate around. I'm going to go fast, press the go button, and it's going to create a big old orbit around this. You can do the same orbit as you probably saw in the uh, quick shots mode. The difference here is that you can actually have this be a moving object. Uh, so you can see from this video I shot yesterday where I was cycling, it's orbiting around me while I'm cycling. So you can be any sort of moving object as well. Uh, it just does that orbit. I'm going to stop that though for a second here. And you see I'm now back into spotlight mode. Uh, what spotlight mode does is it keeps it focused on the windmill. So now I'm in control of the drone. So I'm going to say I'm going to go up like this. I'm going to go left. Uh, and it's going to keep the camera basically in some way, shape, or form on the windmill. This is useful if you want to control the movements around something, uh, but you want the camera to be roughly focused on the windmill. Again, this also works with moving objects. So if you're chasing a car or a person or whatever the case may be, uh, maybe you're not like an amazing drone pilot. This is like a really great cheat because it'll keep the camera focused on it and you can control the altitude and uh, all the things that you want from a kind of scene standpoint. Which then gets us to the next piece of this, which is actor track. For that, I'm going to show you that in real time. We're going to swap the battery one more time uh, and then we'll do an, a live actor track so you can see how that works. <laughs> the lady just ran directly over the drone, like straight up over the drone on the thing. I did not see her coming. Obviously my fault, but uh, we may be using our DJI Care stuff here. Holy cow. Is it still alive? Oh, f me. She just ran her bicycle straight over the middle of the drone, like literally over the middle of the drone. And I think it's fine. Holy cow. Like, it feels a bit squishy. We're gonna fly with it. We're gonna see if it's good once I pick up my bike. It seems a little unhappy. I'm not gonna lie. Weak signal. Yeah, I'm sure it's weak signal. You got your, your brain smashed in. Just to understand what she did, to reenact it. This is her bicycle. She hit it dead on like this, straight over it, and just both wheels, and it just, it popped, like it didn't even snap otherwise, but uh, clearly it's broken. Okay, with all that drama sorted out, it's time to show you actor track. Uh, now, it's a bit breezy out here today. It's about 40 kilometers an hour, about 25 miles an hour wind, but no big deal for the Mini 4 Pro. Uh, I would go up to about 50 kilometers an hour, 55 kilometers an hour, without any major concern, but that's me. Uh, but I just kind of want to show you it out here. And I'm going to get it up in the air, and then I'll show you how it all works. Okay, actor track is just like one of the spotlight modes. And every time you take off, uh, it'll automatically turn off the subject scanning. It seems like a bit of a bug at this point, but I'm going to turn that back on, going the dot, 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 controls menu, and then subject scanning. And now you'll see me as a subject. So I will now just simply choose uh, myself as a subject. I will choose actor track and they have two options, trace and parallel. Trace means to follow from behind, parallel means off to the side. We'll start off with trace for right now. So again, tap that and then you have to choose the go button. Also, by the way, validate that the resolution is what you want. Uh, sometimes it will switch to a different resolution the very first time you use actor track and I'll validate that you recorded. Uh, for whatever reason, DJI has never got on the boat of automatically recording when you're in active track mode. Uh, so at this point, I'm in trace, but it hasn't, I haven't started moving yet. So it doesn't really know what front and back is. Once I start doing that, you'll see it'll start moving and following me. So we'll start off with this very basic stuff. We're gonna go with the uh, tailwind right now. And you're gonna see it's gonna slide in behind me. Also, by the way, I'll drop a link to the bottom there for the uh, mount that I'm using for the bike. It works pretty well. Uh, and right now I'm just kind of cruising along nice and slow to show you this. Uh, you can go in normal mode up to about 40 kilometers an hour, about 25 miles an hour, uh, before it'll slide in behind you. So at this point, I'm just following along just fine. If you look in the lower left-hand corner, you see that little person there. I'm gonna tap that really quickly. Uh, and this basically shows me different ways I can 
follow me. Uh, and this is new on the Mini 4 Pro. It's called their ActiveTrack 360. And what those two rings are is basically two different ways to go ahead and, sorry, I just getting on the bumps, two different ways to go ahead and uh, tell where the drone is gonna go. Uh, so right now it's low and behind me. Uh, but if I kind of swipe, so you're just swiping on these, sorry, it's really bumpy here. If I swipe around this on the lower, the middle inner circle, middle, middle uh, sorry, the inner radius, then it's gonna slowly rotate around me here. You can see that right there, slowly rotating around. Uh, it's on the slow setting as opposed to the fast setting, and I'll show you that in just a second. There we go, and it's gonna hang out in front right there. Pretty straightforward, right? No problems hanging out there in front. Uh, you can go in front, there's, there's no issues doing that. Okay, now if I wanna go out and high, I basically swipe around so it'll go out to the outer radius and high. So we're gonna do that now. We're gonna tell it to go out off to my side over there and up high. Pretty cool, right? Pretty straightforward, that one way up there. Uh, and the way you can change that, now it's gonna hang out there and apparently I swiped all the way around that, uh, sorry. There's all these bumps in the pavement here. So uh, you're getting something a little more cinematic this time, which is fine. And what this allows you to do is just swipe the path that you want Act Attract to do, uh, which again is pretty darn cool. Now, there's a couple settings I wanna show you before we go back and kind of pick up the speed a little bit or attempt to in this wind anyways. So if I go to the dot, dot, dot in the upper right-hand corner here, and I'm on the controls option, I go down to focus track, and you see this person and vehicle. There's the inner circle and the outer circle like I showed you, and then here's the inner radius and the outer radius. And you can change these different radiuses right there, radii. Uh, so you can see I've changed it out to 15 meters for that. If I go down the inner height, and I presume this is the outer height, uh, but it's in Chinese, hopefully they'll fix that. And I've increased that to be 15 meters. Sorry, I get a strong wind warning here, but no big deal. And then I've changed the camera motion now to fast. Uh, you can also do near ground, but given the water and everything, I'm not gonna do that. Uh, that allows you to descend below two meters. Uh, so I don't see a reason to do that right now. And for this little section here, we will choose parallel just for fun. And I'll show you the difference on that. Now, here we go. I'm gonna bring the altitude down. Now you can control the altitude as well as the direction any time by using the sticks. So I just pull the left-hand stick down. Here we go. And it's gonna descend like this. And I can also control the distance to me by using the right-hand stick. Wait for the bump. There we go. I'm gonna say, I want you to go to out. Sorry, out a little bit more. So pull back on the stick. And now, I can move a little bit faster. Uh, I know I have an entire video dedicated to active track, how this works, where it works well, where it doesn't work so well, um, much faster speeds and the trees, etc. that you can check out in the corner. This is sort of just like a, a little tease because I hope I don't snap the phone off the mount. So I've got a structure coming. I'm just gonna go above it just because I don't feel super confident at the moment. There we go. And we'll see if it'll pick me up on the other side. Nope, it lost. Oh, there we go. Good job, little guy. We'll spin back around again. And you know, it's gonna find itself on this side over here. So it'll eventually swing back around. It's gonna try to catch up. Uh, there we go. Now it's struggling in the wind here because there is this wind. I'm now going into the headwind. So generally speaking, when active track struggles, it'll slide in behind you instead. Also know ActiveTrack can be used on vehicles, uh, both the ActiveTrack mode as well as the POI mode. Right now I'm using the POI mode on this boat that just kind of floated by, uh, doing a slow rotation into the wind, very slow rotation. And again, you can adjust your height and distance to that object, which is kind of cool with the controls. Again, all that's covered in my complete ActiveTrack video up in the corner there. Okay, so now I wanna show you sport mode. I've got a boat coming out over there, and I'm gonna show you where I use sport mode the most. So we're gonna take off real quick. Here we go up and out of the way and the way you access sport mode is on the controller right there you just swipe to the s for sport mode now you see it on the controller and i want to get to this boat quickly before it gets out of the harbor here so i'm just going to go sport mode to it because that gives me a much higher uh speed threshold here we go now we're getting closer to the boat in that sport mode uh, now at some point i could switch over to basically non-sport mode in fact instead i'm going to switch over not to the 2x zoom but to the slow mode to get some slow mode footage right here there we go, stay off the side. Strong wind warning, no problem. Keeping it in sport mode so I have that uh, opportunity to get in the battery over current, which is kind of surprising. I'm on the plus battery right now. A bit surprised to see that. Okay, and now when I'm done here, I can zoom on back. Again, I'll switch it back over to sport mode. I always get a bit of elevation, by the way, because it gives me more flexibility in case something goes wrong. And watch that speed down there. Now I should be getting a tailwind coming back here. So watch the speed as I do this. 
increasing up to 55 kilometers an hour. Let me find the exact tail when it should be about this angle right here. There we go, 56. And it's about the top and out right there. Okay, now there's a skill that I think every pilot should learn. In fact, this is actually a great scenario for it where it's windy out here, which is hand catching a drone. Uh, you know, you can land a drone the normal way by just pressing the button and let it land when it's calm out or if you have nice ground. But if you're in snow or on a beach or anywhere where it's sketchy, uh, the wind here where it may be kind of bouncing all over the place close to the ground, it's much easier to simply do this via hand catch. Uh, let me show you the, the key thing people do wrong. I'm going to show you what they do wrong. Uh, that way you can avoid it. So right now we have the drone right here, right in front of me. I'm going to bring the drone down. I'm going to bring it down to shoulder level. Sorry, get a little closer so you can see it in the camera view. I'm going to bring the drone down to shoulder level, right? Shoulder level right here, good. Now I will approach the drone. I will reach underneath it, grab it, and flip it over. If you stand here and try to grab it as it comes down, it will fail. It will fly away from you. It knows that's a bad situation. So you just bring it down here, and then once you turn it over like this, that will turn off the drone automatically. It turns off the props, and you're good to go. Uh, I use hand catching like 90% of the time because it's just so much faster. And avoid the scenario where like you close to the ground, you hit a little rock or something, pebble, break a prop. So with that, let's go ahead and jump inside and look at the quick app master shots and all that kind of fun stuff. Now I'm gonna do a quick walkthrough of the app in terms of getting footage off of the drone onto your phone, as well as getting that master shot built that we saw earlier on. Uh, so what I've got here is a drone. I've got the arms open up, that's really, really important, and I've turned it on. Uh, now the key thing here is not to have the remote control powered on. If the remote control is on nearby, either of the two remote controls, this will not work. The direct connect feature uh, basically shuts off as soon as it connects to the remote control. So what this does is it establishes a connection between the drone and the phone using Wi-Fi. Uh, and you can see down the bottom there of the app, it shows the ability to switch to quick transfer mode. When I tap that switch right there, it'll go ahead and connect it to the drone via Wi-Fi. It may take a couple of seconds, and then it'll ask you to join it, and then from there, allow you to choose to view the album. At that point, you'll see all the footage on your drone, uh, as well as the SD card inside of it, uh, and you can swipe through, and you'll notice there are different icons for different things. So one icon for slow-mo footage or regular footage, uh, and if we go down, we'll find the one that has a little star next to it, and that is the one for the master shots. So if I tap that open right there, you can see the option to create master shots. Uh, now when I do that, it's gonna ask to download the footage uh, if you haven't already downloaded. In this case, I've already downloaded it, so it's gonna go straight into it. Now at the bottom, you'll see a bunch of different templates. These are roughly 15 to 20, maybe 30 second videos, depending on each one. So I can choose springtime, for example, a 15 second video that'll create. I can choose vibes, and each of them had different sets of music with it, and so on. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and choose the springtime one here, and then I will choose to export it out. It'll export out to my phone, and I'll play it for you right now. So with that all set, we'll back out into the main album here, press back again, and again, you can see all the footage. Uh, and if we look at the Quick Shots one, this is where you may just want to simply download that entire thing. Know at the top though, there's the info button. This allows you to see more information about it. You can see the file size, resolution, FPS, etc. So it's about 236 megs, not too bad. In the lower right hand corner, I can choose to download this and choose to either download the full thing or a trimmed portion. Uh, the trimmed portion is useful if you know you had, for example, a 20 minute video, that would take forever to download. But this short little 21 second clip won't take too long. You can see the progress bar in the lower right hand corner moving along pretty quick. Again, it's super important to have the wings of your drone opened up. That is basically the antenna that lets us go. If you have it closed, uh, it'll be a lot slower and will often fail. Now there are other sections to the DJI app where you can basically do uh, some AI video creation as well as download more templates, etc. But for me, this is primarily just what I use right here. Most of the time I'm grabbing short clips from this to upload to Instagram, or I'm taking the SD card out of the drone, sticking it in my computer and downloading the footage that way. Uh, the reason why you want to do this is mostly just to get it to your phone. If you're trying to get the footage to your computer, then simply just take the SD card out, put it in your computer, it'll be a heck of a lot faster. Okay, there you go. Everything you need to know about the DJI Mini 4 Pro, including how durable it is against bicycle tires somewhat durable. Uh, anyways, if you found this video interesting or useful, go ahead and whack that like button at the bottom there, or hit subscribe for plenty more sports technology goodness. With that, have a good one.